Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. If you're a teen or preteen, you may now be dismissed. Uh, follow Miss Tammy out. Uh, she's teaching our teens and preteens today. Good to see everyone. Uh, we've got several visitors in the house. I got to meet you in the lobby. And thanks for coming to Creekside Community Church. Good morning, online community. Saw that several of you had tuned in this morning. It's just great to see everyone. So preparing the lesson this week, as you can see by the title behind me, On the Level. And before we get into uh, the text, the, the reason I chose this title was from the scripture text that we're going to look at. We're going to look at two texts, one from the Old Testament, one from the New, Amos and Colossians. But I want you to be thinking about measuring things. Uh, let's be more specific, how you measure things. Let's even get more specific, how God measures things and how God measures us as his people. And so we're going to be talking about a plumb line. I actually have a plumb line, but finding it was another thing, especially when you have two boys that growing up like to go through your toolbox. Some of you can identify. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get into the text and later, but I found some tools that I grew up with. Of course, on the level, this is a level that I actually use. Many of you know I, I'm an RVer. Tammy and I love to camp and have had all kinds of campers and everything. And when you're setting up your campsite, you got to have it level, two reasons. You want the doors to work properly, swinging in and out, and you want your refrigerator to be cold. If it's not, if you know, if you're RV or you know what I'm talking about, but you got to, see, you got to get the bubbles right. So that's the level. Are you level this morning with God? This, I actually found while looking for the plumb line, this is very special to me. Some of you have never seen this before. When I was a kid, I liked to do this just because I thought it was cool, because it looks cool, right? Some, some, of you, some, some of you under 18 are saying, what in the heck is that? <laughs> Why this is special, it, it's a ruler, it's a yardstick, not really a yardstick, it, it's a measuring tool, but this was my dad's. And I grew up on a farm, and if you grew up on a farm, you know you have to fix things and cut wood and make things and, and, and do things that need measuring. And I can't tell you, I'm getting sentimental. I got sentimental when I found it at the time. I watched my dad take it out and draw a line or measure something because it had to be true. It had to be level. It had to be right. We as followers of Jesus need to be true. We need to be on the level. We need to be right. And there is a standard that God has. And the problem is, there's a standard the world has. And you know the two are not in agreement. Even more so today, somebody say amen. In fact, even Christians are accepting the world standards in place of God's standards. So I want you to get that in, the he in your head, and we're going to compare the two, and we're going to look. So let's go into the Old Testament text. Let's look at Amos, Amos 7, 7 through 9. This is Amos the prophet talking. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall, picture a wall, look at this wall, built with a plumb line. Now, let me say, if a wall's built with a plumb line, a plumb is usually, in ancient times, it's just a heavy object. You'll see one in one of the slides later on. Usually, sometimes they're, they almost look like a spinning top, but you draw a line and you make that wall level. Like when building your house, you don't want any uneven walls. You want the house true and correct. So the wall was built with the plumb line, and the Lord, notice, had the plumb line in his hand. Then the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, God's people. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Once again, what had happened, the people of Israel, the people of God, like sometimes we today, they gotten off track. And God holds a fine and true level line and says, you are not meeting my standards. 
You're worshiping idols. You're committing sexual immorality. You're doing all these things, and I'm fixing to set it right. So the great prophet Amos, he was given a vision of a plumb line which would become the standard. Hear me, we're going to use that word a lot. The standard by which God's people would need to live. Now that represents in this passage a standard by which we today, followers of Jesus, the faithful need to live. But more importantly, you need to hear this. It's a measure, we're talking about measuring, it's a measure by which divine judgment is gauged. Because one day, God's measuring standards will be the standard we all are judged by. It's not what the world thinks, it's what God thinks. It's what God says. So in Amos' vision, the definitive measurement is cast against the sins of humanity in a stark warning. Should one align their faith and practices with the standards of the plumb line, if you line up with God's standards, all will go well. But on the contrary, if we choose to disregard the standards of measurement, of the plumb line that God uses and venture out and create our own measurements. And isn't that what we see happening today, church? Aren't they taking and twisting scriptures for things to say, well, that really doesn't mean that. You can do this. You know, when God says thou shalt not commit adultery, there's no middle ground. It's black and white with God. Well, a, l- a little bit, that's not really cheap. Uh, today's standards have taken and prostituted, to use that word, the standards of God. But on the contrary, if we disregard the plumb line of God and we create new standards of measurement, the whole structure becomes unstable. If you build a house off level, then you're going to have all angles off level. If you choose to follow the foundations, the standards of the world, your life is going to be off a solid foundation why Jesus told the parable of building on the rock, not the sand. The sand shifts, the rock does not. And when the storms of life come, the house built on the rock stands true and firm. So this inadequate structure, if we choose the world standards, it's at odds with the forces of gravity, we could say. The conflict that's expressed here, what must lead to a standard of instability. And if you have a standard of instability from the world standards eventually you'll have a collapse. The house will fall. And that goes for us, that goes for a city, that goes for a country, and that goes for a nation. Before Abraham Lincoln said it so great, a house divided to itself cannot stand, it was written in the words of God. And that's what we're seeing somewhat play out today. So for Amos, the prophet, this message from God is powerfully clear. The people of God, much like today, were choosing standards that were in conflict with Scripture, with the Word of God, and fidelity, faithfulness to the Almighty Creator. And that includes, like today, doctrines of political control, economic prosperity, And personal priority. Boy, that's a big one today. Well, I I can do that because that's what I feel like doing. Well, that's not what God says you can do. Sometimes you talk that way, they'll shout you down for hate speech. Amen? I'm serious. That's the time we're living in today. Where personal preference has taken, and, and I'm talking even among some Christians, personal preference has taken over where God's teachings of sacrifice, of service, and surrender become a priority. So how do we look at this? Well, I want to take you to Colossians now. Because Paul wrote the church in Colossae, much like us as a church, just a group of believers, and he gave them some tools. And we're going to read the passage, and then we're going to pull out what living by God's standards, things we need to draw to put in our toolbox to pull out in this troubled time that we live in. Paul writes it this way, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae. He could be, if he was alive today, he would say, to God's holy people in Hot Springs, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Tell us why, Paul. 
because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel, the good news, is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard of it and truly understand God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. Wouldn't that be great to hear a word from the Apostle Paul said, since I've heard of your faithfulness and love, I haven't stopped praying for you saints at Creekside. That's just amazing. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have endurance and patience. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Watch this. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Amen. So let's look, let's unpack this Colossians text, and let's see what plumb looks like for us today. That's a plumb line. That's what they would hang to be level. So our, my goal to you today is to give you several tools to stay level with God, to not let the outside influences of the world come into your life and to where you compromise yourself and take worldly standards versus godly standards. Number one, we should be a people known for faith and love. The Colossians, faith and love was the first thing Paul recognized. And I'm proud to say Creekside is full of faith and love. The fact that you're here right today shows your faithfulness. Amen? The Word tells us to gather together and forsake not gathering together. And you're here together. You didn't hear me. You didn't come here this morning, and I, I promise you. And if you did, you need to change. If you got up this morning and said, man, i got to go hear Mark because he's just fantastic and he's great, you're coming for the wrong reason. That's a fake amen, Sonny, okay? <laughs> I love teaching. I love each one of you. But you came here for each other. Somebody say amen. amen. Because we're a family. And you came here to see people that you like hanging out with and being with. You came here to see people that you can share your, your victories and your struggles with. You came here because we're a loving faith and love for each other. And we love this community. You're here because you're part of community. You're here because you're following God's standards to come and assemble. And it's so good to assemble in a time for not too long ago, we couldn't assemble. Remember that? But now we have this interaction. We should be a people known for faith and love because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel has come to you. Just reading that, I thought about the faith for you that's stored up in heaven. Do you realize that you will spend a longer time with some of these people right here than some of your own family? Does anybody beside me have some lost family members? I'm going to see you and you're going to see me in eternity compared to 70, 80, 90 years here on earth. Think about that. Because you have the hope of faith and love. So our first level, our first standard is be a people, be a person of faith and love. i got to share this story. This is just dropped in. Uh, Friday, I got to, to, and I meant to do this as an intro. Uh, 
many of you know I work in foster care as well. And, and there's even measurements there. Uh, we have to measure rooms to place children in. There's a lot of measuring. If I come and open your house, I have to walk the house and do a preliminary walkthrough and everything. Well, I've been blessed to serve this family for the last three years. And a year ago, they took in two little preemie babies, one-year-olds. And over the course, the biological parents weren't doing their part and abandoned these babies. And Friday, this couple, they have a 14-year-old biological son, but this couple had made the decision if the parents' rights were ever terminated, and they're my age and slightly older. So they're like mid-40s. Y'all got that. Good, y'all. That, see, that's just a little test to make sure y'all listening. So they go to court, and the, the attorney asks questions. And one of the questions is, why do, you want, why do you want to adopt these little boys, these twin boys? And the mom said some beautiful words, but the dad's really got me. He said, he started his answer with this, as a man of faith. I truly believe the Lord has led these two boys to my home, and I believe that the Lord has led us to take these boys and raise them in him. Now, there's a person of faith and love. I mean, this adopted son got misty-eyed when he heard that. I was like, in open court, to start your sentence as a man of faith. That's a testimony. That's a declaration. That's a proclamation that I believe in God. And I believe God has caused circumstances for me to be the adopted father of Liam and Luke. It's, it's amazing. We should be a people of faith and love. Thank you for indulging me. Number two, we should be a people bearing fruit by God's grace. Where's the fruit in your life? Where's, are, you, are you having God discussions, Jesus discussions, salvation discussions with people? Are you listening to their struggles? The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it's been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. When's the last time you had a grace conversation with somebody at your workplace, at the ball field? You should be bearing fruit. Many of you are. Many of you are sharing like, hey, you need to come visit us at Creekside. Or, hey, I I see you're going through this. How can my church help you with this? Christianity is not a couch potato sport. Christianity, can I just, can I give you all a secret? Christianity is messy. Amen? Ministry is messy. There are broken and hurting people that need help. It's like a hospital triage to where we are called by Jesus to be bearing fruit, to take the gospel, as I said, the good news. When's the last time you just told someone the good news of Jesus? Do you know you don't have to go through what you're going through because Jesus loves you, he died for you, and he can change your life if you just come to him. If you'd leave the worldly standards and come to God's standards, you'd see a direct change in your life. It's as easy a conversation as that. Number three, we should be being filled with the knowledge of God and the will of His Spirit. Continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will throughout all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Notice it's the Spirit that gives it. That you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit again in every good work growing in the knowledge of God. How do you get in the knowledge of God? Open your Bibles. Get in the Word, have a daily devo, find a plan. I mean, today, more than anything, this iPad, this phone, I've got the Bible app on my phone. I can, I've got three or four Bible apps on my phone, so can you. It can give me a, the minimum, I can get it to program a verse a day, just to come up at a certain time of day. And I look at this verse, and, and you know what I fi- found? And I, I, by no means, I think it's coincidental. The verses of a day that come up before me are the ones I really need to be reading. Does that happen to anybody but me? Things of grace. Like when I'm having a really busy, I, I've, in my old age, in my late 40s, <laughs> I fail. I, what I'm working on is patience. Not, not really with people, just with things. I, and and let, me, let me clarify, 
with the hurried life, because life is just so, so fast and busy. Recently, if you saw, me, saw some of my posts on Facebook, I got to unplug a little bit with my, my son, and that was great, where we didn't have any time schedule, nobody was calling. It was like I even made the line. I said, I don't have to be anywhere till like Thursday at 10 o'clock, and this was Sunday night. And it was great to slow things down and just be in the presence of God. And so those daily verses, a lot of them come up, speak about keeping step with God, learning patience from God. Uh, who do you think sending me those in all honesty? It's not that website because God can work in however ways he wants to. You, some of you know that. I see heads nodding. There's scriptures that come up before you and you're like, boy, I needed that today. And sometimes they're really encouraging and sometimes they're really convicting, aren't they? I'm like, okay, yeah, Lord, I got that. I hear you. You don't have to speak any louder. Next, we should be finding strength. This is a lot like the last one. We should be finding strength in his power that gives us endurance and patience. Where, where do you get your power from? Where do, you, where do you get your mark to stay level? How do you know that you're level with God? Well, by his word. His word is the standard. His word is what we'll be judged by in divine judgment. It's not, it's not what the government says. It's, it's not what you, maybe your particular church says. It's the Word of God that the book is going to be open, and the Word of God, which is Jesus Himself as well, will call us to a standard. But where do you draw your strength? When, when life becomes a pressure cooker, what's your plan B? Where do you retreat to? Do, do you self-medicate maybe with medication or, or food? I, I'm, a, I'm a big stress eater. If I get stressed, man, I, I can go through four peanut butter jelly sandwiches in a night, big old glass of milk, and then feel like crap the next day. I ate four peanut butter jelly sandwiches, <laughs> right? Y'all with me? Y'all ever do that? I mean, man, or, or even, you ever open one bag, you ever, you ever had good intentions to open a bag of chips and realize they're gone? Or, or my, the devil, the devil's too for me is that large bag of peanut M&M's. Yeah. I confess, I've ate a whole bag. That's like nine zillion calories. That's why, that's why, that's why I look the way I look. I'm telling you. But do I, do, do you know, because you know, you know why we do that? You know why we do that? Can I be real? Because it's easy. Because it's comfortable. Instead of opening my iPad and pulling up Amos and reading an encouraging word or going to the Psalms. Now, if anybody struggled, David struggled and reading some strength from the Psalms when I'm in a hard place and saying, how, how did God speak to David? David had some hard places. How did God speak to Gideon? How did God speak to Moses, to Joshua? How did they overcome they didn't have peanut M&M's back in those days, I don't think. Probably a good thing. But how, how, how do you reply when your life becomes a pressure cooker? Where do you draw your strength from that gives you, here's the key word, endurance. Because remember a couple messages ago, Christianity is not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a marathon. And, and, and some of y'all will amen this. Where I'm at now by age and spiritual level is way different than I was 20 or 30. And be all honest, I, I'm, I'm approaching the end of my marathon. You know, Lord willing, I pray I have another 20 years. I pray that for my kids' sake so I can enjoy them, hopefully see some grandkids. But I'm not promised tomorrow. God could take me right here, right now, next week, next day. But Christianity, this life of faith, is a marathon. And so we need patience. We need perseverance that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. We need an endurance, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might. That's what we miss, too. We depend on our might rather than His. My Burger King Christian example, right? Oh, I can do that. No, my faith. No, no, no. It's not you doing it, it's God doing it through you. It's God's strength 
in you by the power of his Holy Spirit. Why don't we tap more into that power? Being strengthened with all power according to, look at that verse, his glorious might, his glorious strength. Why? So that you may have great endurance and patience. And last, Colossians, that passage concludes with this thought. We should be thankful. We should be a people with an attitude of gratitude that God rescued us from the dominion of darkness into his kingdom and forgiven our sins. Giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of his Son, the kingdom of light, in whom he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You know what I heard when I first read that passage? If you've confessed Christ, if you've been born again, no matter how bad the world gets, no matter how bad the darkness looks, God's got you. God's rescued you. This, we may watch the decline of modern civilization. We may, some of us living here today, may, God forbid, see this country fall. But can I tell you, that's not the end for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. It may fall, but if you've been born again, God has rescued you from the dominion of darkness, no matter how dark it looks. Because you've stepped into the kingdom of the sun, which is the kingdom of light. So, I want to conclude with this and remind you of something. In the Gospels, Jesus had a saying. It, it, it's really neat in the King James. He would say this. He would say, verily, verily, and then give a truth statement. Or he would say, verily, I say to you. In the NIV, it's truly. Now, somebody shout out, what was Jesus' occupation? A carpenter. What does a carpenter do? Works with wood. Works with tools. Scholars say that that word, verily, verily, truly, truly, can actually be translated, that's plumb. That's level. And if you look, I'll give you some. They're not on the, the overhead. Matthew 18, 3, Jesus says, Verily I say to you, except you be converted and become like little children, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's a true statement. Luke 23, 43, Jesus said to him, the thief on the cross, Verily I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's a statement of truth. John 8, 51, verily I say to you, if a man keeps my sayings, he shall never see death. Amen. That's a true saying. Now get this, this is what I love. I found this research in it. Jesus is not merely saying, believe me, this is true. He is saying, I know this firsthand. I know this is on the level. Since many of these comments are on heavenly, spiritually, or godly issues, Jesus, when he used verily, verily, it's part of his claim of divinity. If anybody can say this is a true statement, it's Jesus. Because he is God. He is the Word of God. So Jesus was not merely aware of these truths. Jesus is the one who originated these truths. All throughout Scripture. Jesus, when he says verily, verily, is reminding us of God's plumb line that will be used for divine judgment. By these words, those are our standards. By this scripture is how we should live. So the question this morning is, are you on the level with God? Is your life level or is it off kilter are there things in your life that God's convicting you maybe this morning maybe this week maybe by these scriptures that you know what if God held this up to my life 
the bubble would not be in the middle. There's some things, some things I need to straighten. There's some things I need to make plumb, right, true. Maybe in relationships, maybe in finances, maybe in living, maybe in bad habits. Only you know, you and God. But the question is, are you living by the standards of God or are you living by the standards of the world? Are you on the level with God? If you're not, I'm going to pray. And you can pray. And it's as simple as saying, God, you know what? I, I'm, I'm off level. My measurement would fall short of your standard. I, I, I've been around worldly people, and I've let the world creep into my personal lifestyle. I have, we're, we're called to be a holy and separate people, not to look like the world. That's the problem, isn't it, church? That so many, yeah, I, I, I see so many Christians, I use those quotes, especially celebrities that say they're Christians, and in the next interview I hear three F-bombs. Or I hear them take a stance on an issue, issue that scripturally is not sound. But I'm a Christian. Do you measure up? That's the question. And if your measurement falls short, the good news is that he's brought us over from darkness to a kingdom of his son, a kingdom of life for the forgiveness of our sins. And we can ask the forgiveness at any time. And you can do that right there in your seat. You can find me after church. You can find any of our members. They'd be glad to pray with you as well, or our leaders. But I'm going to pray now. I'm going to pray for me. I'm going to pray for you. That when God drops the plumb line, when God takes out his level to look at Mark, I'm on an even keel. And he says, well done. You're level. You're true. Let's pray. Father, we need your standards. We need your words. I hate to say it's encouraging, but it somewhat is that when we read the Old Testament, we see the people you call your people, the people of God, we see them constantly missing the mark. That, that does give us some hope that, no, we're flawed too. Because we allow things in our life that the world pours in on us that we make substitutions what we used to think we would never do, we get lax on, we get comfortable, and we don't call out sin like we used to call out sin from the church and from our own individual lives. We've become lax. Father, your, your word doesn't speak or call us to that. It calls us to holiness. To be holy as you are holy, God, is what your word says. For us to strive to it. And although we wear this flesh and bone, it's the spirit that lives within us. And we're made in your image. We're, we're made in your image to reflect you, God, to the world, to be your witness, to be your ambassadors. So my prayer, God, is when you pull out those tools of measurement, of trueness, of who really belongs to you and is doing your will and your word, that you find us all on the level. You find us all lined up with the plumb line that you hold because, God, we will see it again on that great day of judgment when we'll all give account of everything in our lives. And the measure you will use will be your holy words. So, God, help us to have a heart to live out those standards. Help us to have discernment and wisdom to see when the standards of the world try to creep in too our lives in the church and our faith communities. Father, it seems the trend is truly scriptural where evil is being called, being called good and good is being called evil. And Father, we pray for a revival. We pray for a resurgence back to your ways, back to your standards, back to the Judeo-Christian ethics and morals that ring so true that, that once started this nation. But God, it starts with us. It starts with one person living out that life in front of others, his family, his workplace, 
his community, his, his, his recreational activities. May we be like Jeff in that adoption hearing that said, as a man of faith or as a woman of faith, here's what I have to do. Here's what I have to say. Here's how I'll live my life for you, Lord, because I want to be on the level. I want to be on the level with you because you rescued me from the dominion of darkness by the glory of your son, Jesus, and to your son's kingdom, the kingdom of light, that we may have this forgiveness of sins. We thank you for that grace. May we be a people of all the things we've mentioned here today, Lord. And we pray this in your Son's name, our Savior, Jesus. Amen.